after two and a half years of our work, being in the public eye through our website and almost daily media reportage, I believe there is nothing more or better that I can say that what is expressed in each of the reports we have released, documenting the laborious and painstaking process of audit, the alarming misuse and waste of government resources, and the urgent need for fiscal discipline, responsibility, and accountability of our public servants. On the other hand, the restive communities we live in today, the insistent clamor for investigations from practically all sectors, and personalities of all colors and persuasion weighing in on the raging issues of the day, would perhaps indicate that our work has broken sacred ground and has disturbed the nation considerably. Again, if it's any indication that I have arrived on my way here, I just received a text from someone who's very close to me, whose integrity I do not doubt for a moment, telling me something like, heads up, uh, a big fund has been put up by legislators for your impeachment. So with that, let me address therefore the questions posed in the briefing notes as directly and briefly as I can. On the major barriers or challenges to integrity in governance that I have found along the way, I would say that these are the system of patronage or the padrino system, the culture of impunity, the fast food or quick fix mentality, personality-based politics, and the resistance to change. Political and other connections are the greatest go-getters in this country. Never mind merit, principle, or ethics. Many public officials are the benevolent pater familias, dispensing favors to their constituencies from cradle to grave out of public funds. These practices are aggravated by a rich culture of getting away with it, mostly because our, we are a wimpy kind super patient and forgiving people, not want to steer the hornet's nest and suffer the intolerable consequences. Then there is the inordinate obsession for quick fixes, shortcuts, and band-aid solutions, fast anything and everything, especially wealth, status, and power. Hard and honest work has become a badge of shame and stupidity. The mentality now is, if one can get ahead quickly by patronage and impunity, why even bother to work? It is always more comfortable to maintain the status quo and more fun to circulate white papers and trade against the new leadership rather than shape up or shape out. On the Commission's strategy in addressing these challenges, I would say, and I say, that, the, that spotting the vulnerabilities early on, acknowledging they exist, a firm and unwavering resolve to address them, and consistent application in action. In short, set the tone in no uncertain terms and do as you say without fear or favor. Let me illustrate. As soon as I assumed office, there was a steady threat to my office of employees and public officials alike to introduce themselves and make a courtesy call. Invariably, commonalities like geographical origin, friends, school, church, favorite food, relatives, etc. would surface. These are all subtle ways to connect. Soon, I was deluged with letters and calls from politicians and high-ranking officials, including from Goa, as well as long-lost relatives, recommending the hiring of job seekers, promotion of this and that employee, or reassignment to a particular po uh, post. This is a classic case of patronage. Without meaning any disrespect or arrogance, 
I did not allow myself to feel obliged to accommodate them. Instead, I took every opportunity to announce to all employees that I would decide only on the basis of merit and that they do not need a padrino. I encouraged them to be their own padrinos, to promote themselves solely by hard and faithful work. If they cannot rely on their own merits, I told them they do not deserve to be promoted. And I did count endorsements against them. Soon, the letters and the calls stopped, and there has since been a steady hiring and promotion of truly deserving ones. This, to me, is a major accomplishment, even as I continue to be personally attacked and is seriously undermined by those who did not make the grade or have otherwise been thwarted in their erstwhile happy days. But I am at peace because I know in my heart that I did as I should and thankful that God has given me steely nerves to carry it out. On the support of government, civil society, private sector, and development partners, what would I want to expect? For government to respect our independence, familiarize themselves with accounting and auditing rules and obey them, take our audit findings and recommendations seriously and comply, and accord to our auditors only such support items as are required by law. For civil society and the citizenry as a whole, to responsibly exercise vigilance and avoid partisan politics, to be our eyes and ears in the front lines and help us inform the people about who we are and what we do. For the private sector, to be more proactive in the fight against corruption by starting with themselves and their own brands. To responsibly partner with government as supplier of goods and services and to transact with integrity and honor. And for our development partners, continued generosity please and projects that meet our real needs. Sometimes we get more than enough manuals and consultants and trainings, but not enough infrastructure and collaterals for long-term sustainability. So what is the role of women in promoting integrity in governance? I bring to my job my traditional roles as wife and mother, daughter and sister, at least in the Philippine context. A nurturer, a caregiver, an enabler, a street psychologist, an arbiter, keeper of the purse, disciplinarian, teacher and role model, meticulous housekeeper, efficient and multitasking household manager. In short, an all-around servant leader who, with tough luck, seeks to launch everyone around her or under her care to a path of achieving the best that God has meant them to be, making sure that what they need to know, they learn in kindergarten, as Robert Fulham did. He said, Most of what I really need to know about how to live and who to do, what to do, and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the Broadway School Mountain, but there in the sun pile at Sunday school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and food milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some. And draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup. The roots go down and the plant goes on and nobody really knows how or why, but we are all like that. 
goldfish and hamsters and white mice, and even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die. So do we. And then remember the Dick and Jane books and the first word you learned. The biggest word of all, look. Everything you need to know is in there somewhere. The golden rule in law and basic sanitation, ecology and politics and equality, and sane living. Take any one of these items and extrapolate them into sophisticated adult terms and apply it to your family life or your government or your world and it holds true and clear and firm. Think what a better world it would be if we all, the whole world, had cookies and milk at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and then lay down with our blankets for a nap. Or if all governments had as a basic policy to always put things back where they found them and to clean up their own mess. And it is still true no matter, no matter how old we are, when we go out into the world, it is best to hold hands and stay together.